Hello everyone and welcome back to Versus, the show that takes art and makes it feel like the Doctor's never-ending battle with the Master, the Daleks, the Cybermen, and James Corden. I'm your host for this show, Mark Ellis, and today it's going to be Time Lord versus Time Lord in an epic showdown of two science fiction titans who held the keys to everyone's favorite time-traveling phone box. Apologies to Bill and Ted, whose phone booth was most excellent. We're talking about David Tennant and Matt Smith. Luckily, I'm not doing this alone. You see, old Mark Ellis usually writes his own scripts for verses, but in the world of Doctor Who, I'm a bit of a neophyte. I'm not that kind of doctor. So I'm aided by head writer of the movie trivia schmodown, PJ Campbell, whose knowledge and love for all things Doctor Who is matched only by his affection for corgis and Mexican pizza. So PJ and I are gonna hop aboard the TARDIS and get this battle for space and time underway. Don't expect me to join your little Scooby gang. At some point, one of these two Time Lords will receive the coveted honor of being a versus victor. Here's how we'll determine a winner. Round one, box office. Round two, tomato meter slash audience score. Round three, iconic moments. Round four, legacy. And then we'll finally do a wild card round that could take us to any time, any place, just like the TARDIS itself. Dinosaurs on a spaceship. And keep in mind, I did say box office, which indicates we're going to be talking about Matt Smith and David Tennant's entire career, but we're going to be focusing heavily on Doctor Who. And a shout out to Tom Baker, who first donned the long scarf and floppy hat in 1974 serial Robot. Now it's time to grab our jelly babies and maybe some fish fingers and custard, and most importantly, do not blink. Uh, I, just, I, I did it again. Let's dive into a wibbly wobbly battle for all the medical degrees between these two accomplished actors. Geronimo! Round one, box office. It's common knowledge that money makes the world go around, so the box office draw of our two titans of science fiction seems like a good place to start. In the first corner, we have Scotland native and the voice of everyone's favorite penny-pinching duck Scrooge, David Tennant. Thanks, lad. Born David McDonald before professionally changing his name to avoid confusion with another actor, DT gained notoriety in geek circles in the mid-2000s, appearing in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire and Russell T. Davies' BBC miniseries Casanova before being cast as the replacement for Christopher Eccleston's ninth Doctor by showrunner Russell T. Davies for season two of the newly returned Doctor Who. After a successful three-season run on the series and placing himself in the pantheon of all-time geek icons, Tennant would go on to appear in such TV shows as Jessica Jones, DuckTales, Around the World in 80 Days, and films like 2011's remake of Fright Night opposite the late, great Anton Yelchin and the Dean Devlin-directed Bad Samaritan. That's not to count the many different stage adaptations of Shakespeare plays, including Hamlet, starring everyone's favorite mutant, Charles Xavier. I'm told that's not his real name. That's actually Sir Patrick Stewart. Next time you feel like showing off, don't. In the other corner, we've got a man who needs very little introduction after being memed across the internet, thanks to Morbius. It's Matt Smith. Though Smith originally had his sights set on being a professional footballer, appearing in a stage production of 12 Angry Men with Light of Fire in him, igniting an affection for acting. After a string of small roles in TV and film, Smith would land the coveted role of the Doctor for outgoing 10th Doctor David Tennant for the show's fifth season in 2010, now to be overseen by Stephen Moffat. Matt Smith would be the youngest actor to ever take on the iconic role of Time Lord to that point, playing the character over three seasons before setting his sights on Terminators, Marvel Heroes, Queen Elizabeth II, and Edgar Wright, who, by the way, is in a recent episode of Versus, if you want to go check out our back catalog. Enough time for plugs. Now it's time to talk about the TARDIS, because this show really couldn't have survived without David Tennant and Russell T. Davies after their iconic run, or the undeniable Matt Smith and maybe making bow ties cool? Yeah, it's cool. Bow ties are cool. Are you from another planet? Yeah. Now look, I know this is a whole lot to unpack, so just take a deep breath. We're just getting started. First things first. Be honest. How do I look? Now you're probably thinking, hey, Mark, Doctor Who, it's a TV show, not a, yeah, we know that. I just told you that. These two talents have done quite a bit of entertaining on the big screen as well, and so this round will be determined by who's had the most success when we go to the multiplex. 
Now, it would be easy to assume that David Tennant is going to run away with this round because he's one of the most recognizable actors to come out of Doctor Who and has had a much longer career to date than Matt Smith. However, Smith has been a part of some pretty big properties in his film-going career. I know. In 2008, Matt Smith's first role would come in the dark comedy In Bruges, starring Colin Farrell, though his role was ultimately cut after filming. After finishing his time in the TARDIS, Smith would go on to star in Ryan Gosling's directorial debut, Lost River, as the aptly named villain, Bully. Though the movie was mixed critically and didn't do well at the box office, Matt would start to gain traction for his performance. That would lead to landing another villainous role in the fifth film in the Terminator franchise, in Terminator Genesis. The film only pulled in $440 million at the worldwide box office, which apparently isn't a lot of money, and it killed any traction that led to a next Terminator movie, which was just Dark Fate, another attempt at Terminator 3. Maybe it's time for the Terminators to just take a vacation. Fight me. Smith would go on to have a small role in the film Pride and Prejudice and Zombies before taking the lead role in the thrillers Patient Zero and Charlie Says, the latter of which is where Matt took on the role of infamous cult leader Charles Manson. Unfortunately for Smith, his Manson performance would quickly become overshadowed by Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, in which, yeah, Manson would make another appearance. But Matt's career continues to bear fruit, as he would get a role in both Edgar Wright's Last Night in Soho, as well as a Sony adaptation of Marvel's character Morbius, where he played the central villain. A career pattern I can kind of see coming off of Who is that Smith is trying to shed the madman with a box persona. It's not a box. It's a time machine. For more turns pushing him into a dark place. My whole brain just went, what the hell? Though unfortunately for Matt, neither one of these efforts have lit up the box office just yet. Over Matt Smith's 14 film appearances, his films have still brought in $645 million with an average of $108 million each which is really not too shabby for a Time Lord from Gallifrey, but is it enough to compete with David Tennant? I don't know! David's career starts in 1996 with a cameo as a drunk undergrad in the Christopher Eccleston-led Jude. That's a bit of a fun Doctor Who crossover, right? Who knew their careers would come crashing together again? In 2005, the tide would turn for Tennant as he appeared in that little franchise about that kid with the scar and he cast spells. It's the fourth film in the Harry Potter franchise, The Goblet of Fire, and Tennant played the villainous Barty Crouch Jr. After he departed his Doctor Who days, Tennant would then appear in 2011's Fright Night, taking over the role of Peter Vincent from the iconic Roddy McDowell. Though Tennant's got a handful of British comedies under his belt, including The Decoy Bride and What We Did on Our Holiday, one of the big things pushing his box office success continued to be his voiceover work. A renowned vocal artist, Tennant's box office is bolstered by performances in the How to Train Your Dragon franchise, The Pirate's Band of Misfits, and Ferdinand. So you combine that with the fact that those Harry Potter movies tend to do well at the box office. Goblet of Fire almost made $900 million by itself, which alone overshadows Matt Smith's entire filmography. Over time, David Tennant has accumulated a whopping $1.9 billion at the box office, making for a per-movie average of $194 million. So no matter how you cut it, even as Matt Smith continues to push his career in new, interesting directions and choosing varied roles, David Tennant is the certified box office king in this round. It's still early. The game could change at any minute, but Tennant has a 1-0 lead, and Matt Smith looks towards round two. Uh, yeah, yeah. Round two, tomato meter slash audience score. Matt Smith is good at a lot of things, like fighting Daleks and weeping angels, but he couldn't quite fell Tennant in our last round. I really hope he doesn't hold that against me, because if Doctor Who has taught us anything, we mere mortals on Earth are always in need of saving. And round two might be the best opportunity for Matt to remain competitive in today's proceedings, because it's all about what the critics and audiences were saying after they checked out your projects inside and outside of the TARDIS. Stay away, demon. It's a very interesting turning point here, as two famed Time Lords feature deep work in both TV and film. The starting point, of course, should be the wonderful world of Doctor Who, which they each starred in three seasons of. David Tennant from season two through four, under the watchful eyes of Russell T. Davies, and all three of his seasons are a whopping 100% certified fresh rating. You'd think that would be impossible to match, but Matt Smith's three-year run, seasons five through seven, under Stephen Moffat, bore shockingly similar results, tying at 100% for all three seasons of his run. Those are Toy Story numbers. I've been thinking about it for centuries. 1984 Terminator level perfection. Citizen Kane quality, wait, what? 
Citizen Kane's at 99%. Wow, who is the sled hater that... Uh, that's a topic for another day. Here, since the flagship show Between Our Two Stars leaves us at somewhat of a stalemate, let's hone in on the rest of their careers. Shoot. On the movie side, Tenet's career average, which spans almost 30 years to this point, has an overall critical reception of 61% and a slightly higher audience rating of 63%. It's not necessarily gangbusters. Yeah, but that's because your database got corrupted. But it's enough to keep David fresh, according to our tomato meter and audience score metrics. Matt Smith's career is still in the early days compared to David's, but over the last decade, Matt's critical reception has been... Uh, it's a little rotten. I don't think so. He currently sits at a staggering 48% film average with the critics, but audiences seem to enjoy his films more, leaving him fresh at 61% just behind David Tennant. It's not a huge gap, but Matt's gonna need to step it up if he wants to tie the score. Don't mess with me, sweetheart. And the TV careers of these two thespians begins to shift things in a new direction. David Tennant's had an incredible run on television with so much material, it's hard to keep up with at times. With a career that sprawling, you'd think you'd run into a few duds, but Tennant is doing well with a small screen average of 82% on the tomato meter and 73% on the audience score. It seems like y'all really enjoy everything from Broadchurch and Good Omens to Jessica Jones and Around the World in 80 Days. Maybe the less said about Grace Point, the better. Matt Smith, overall, has a much smaller but equally as impressive TV run. Following Doctor Who, he set his sights on The Crown, where he played Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, opposite Claire Foy as Queen Elizabeth II for the show's first two seasons. And while we've not yet heard anything about House of the Dragon, people seem to be excited for Smith being a prominent lead of the new Game of Thrones prequel. But that's in the future. Or I guess the past. We're really bending time in a lot of different directions today. I don't think it off. Overall, Matt Smith's average is a huge feather in his cap here, taking him to 90% with the critics and 82% overall with audiences. So with that in mind, if you have Matt and David tied, who takes this round? Well, there's only one way to find out. Over both the film and television careers of Matt Smith and David Tennant, the two have done some incredible work, and the only way to break this tie is to find an overall average combining the film and TV work of both actors. The Sith deal in absolutes, I deal with math. Oh, you sexy thing. Starting with David Tennant's career, The Tenth Doctor comes in strong with an overall audience score average of 67%, and on the tomato meter, that average rounds up to 71%. It's not too shabby for almost 30 years of effort. I could do so much more! So much more! But can Matt Smith sneak away with a win here? After comparing the two, eh, he might fall a little short. His audience score average is 64%, just 3% shy of David, and his overall tomato meter average is 56% rotten, putting Tenet over the top of Matt again in round two. It's been a tough call in both rounds, but the numbers speak for themselves. Matt, I'm pulling for you, and don't worry, there's still three rounds to go. Don't worry. I'll soon fix that. Round three, iconic moments. While Matt Smith couldn't quite catch a break on his last round, it wasn't a total blowout and a very even matchup for these two icons of sci-fi. That said, let's get into round three of today's verses, where we're going to take a look at the most iconic moments for Smith and Tennant, both in Doctor Who and in their respective careers. They're no strangers to being icons. I mean, how else do you think they're on a show as popular as Versus? Uh. We only talk the best of the best, starring Eric Roberts, here on the show, and both Smith and Tennant fit that bill. Well, yeah. Starting with David Tennant, there's no doctor who had nearly as many memorable moments in their time in the TARDIS as Tennant, outside of maybe the longest running doctor, played, once again, by the great Tom Baker. From quoting the Lion King dialogue in his first episode, There's more to see than can ever be seen. More to do than... No, hold on. Sorry, that's the Lion King. To the absolutely heartbreaking final line, I don't want to go, twice, mind you, Tennant continually reminded us why he was one of the best to ever take on the role. The Tenth Doctor's TARDIS adventures also led to some of the biggest episodes in the show. Ask any fan about their feelings on the final minutes of the Season 2 finale Doomsday, and you're sure to get a teary-eyed response. Moreover, the Tenth Doctor got to reunite with renowned companion Sarah Jane Smith, once again played by the late great Elizabeth Sladen in School Reunion, also taking on Davros, one of the Doc's most formidable foes in the stolen Earth and Journey's End, as well as meeting historical figures such as Bill Shakespeare. I hear he prefers William. In a long line of iconic moments in the show, no one can quite match Tennant. 
right? That's what I like about you. I don't know, Matt Smith comes pretty close in his three-year run from hosting the first real multi-Doctor Who story in New Who, opposite David Tennant and John Hurt, to his final stand in The Time of the Doctor, Eleven featured many great moments that constantly wowed the fans. From his brilliant first episode, The Eleventh Hour, to arguably one of the greatest hours of TV in Vincent and the Doctor, or you could even toss in his ongoing love story with Alex Kingston's River Song, a love tale so beautiful it spans multiple Doctors and seasons, the bulk of which is carried by Smith's Eleven, these are just some of the most fulfilling moments of the program's history. Between the 10th and 11th Doctors, it's hard to say who wins, so now we have to look at their bigger careers to find a victor. David Tennant's entire filmography is full of wonderful, exciting, and iconic performances, many of which we still talk about today. Who can forget his turn as Barty Crouch Jr. with that weird, nervous tongue thing? A prominent performance choice that plays into Goblet of Fire's biggest reveal. Or where he plays a literal singing detective opposite The Walking Dead's David Morrissey in Blackpool, which is a show you really have to see to believe. But for many younger audiences, David Tennant's most iconic work will come in the form of none other than a popular reference here on the show, Scrooge McDuck in the revival of DuckTales, which lasted three seasons, and they should be 100%. They're not, they should be 100% of the tomato meter. Of course, if we're talking memorable moments, Tennant's turn as the villainous Purple Man opposite Kristen Ritter in Marvel's Jessica Jones is constantly touted as one of the best villain presences Marvel's ever had. Can you get the sound of him yelling, Jessica, out of your brain? Get back here, Jessica! Unfortunately, Matt Smith, man, it's gonna be tough to catch a break in this round too. As awesome as he is for being a meme in his dance sequence in Morbius, what a choice that is, Matt's other performances don't offer nearly as many iconic or standout moments. Sure, he got to appear in a Terminator movie, but he didn't have much to do other than kill John Connor in a blink and you'll miss it sequence before appearing as a CG monstrosity later in the film. The closest thing to iconic outside of Doctor Who we have for Matt Smith comes down to almost appearing in Star Wars Episode Nine before production went in a new direction with the story. So we're left wondering what if instead. However, Matt's work on The Crown was touted as exceptional, so we had to give him a tip of the cap for that, preferably a Stetson. But once again, David Tennant is gonna win this round. How great was he in that Fright Night reboot? He stole the entire movie, and now Matt Smith is losing three to nothing. It means he can't technically win the match, but we still have plenty of time to celebrate the greatness that is the 10th and 11th Doctor Who's. That's not possible. Round four, Legacy. And now we enter the final of our four rounds before the wild card, and we're gonna be looking at the legacies of both David Tennant and Matt Smith. And again, I know David is up 3-0, but we're still here to celebrate these two and their incredible legacies and impact in and outside of the world of Doctor Who. In the case of Matt Smith, it's early on in his career, and we hope it spans decades, so while he doesn't have as much work behind him as David Tennant, he still left quite a mark on Doctor Who with his performance. It's akin to the idea if you give Gene Wilder's Willy Wonka the TARDIS, a fun-loving individual with a dark side just waiting to bubble up from underneath. Making everything from bow ties and fezes cool again, Matt's time in the TARDIS really felt like a breath of fresh air for the audience. And not only that, Matt's years in the TARDIS had him accompanied by Nebula herself, Karen Gillan, before she debuted in the MCU. This was one of her earliest roles, and the Doctor and Amy have continued to be celebrated as one of the great pairings ever in the TARDIS, thanks to the wonderful chemistry between Smith and Gillan. Following up on Tenet's era was never going to be easy, but Matt Smith made it look effortless, as well as being the Doctor during the show's 50th anniversary, a monumental benchmark that let Smith, Moffat, Tenet, and John Hurt celebrate the legacy to the show. Matt Smith's most watched episode during this run, A Christmas Carol, would draw over 12 million people at home to tune in for this Christmas Day adventure. Smith's entire Who catalog would average 7.8 million people watching his series on a weekly basis, a remarkable amount when you consider he was following arguably the most popular doctor ever in David Tennant, who averaged over 8 million per episode during his run. His most watched episode, another Christmas one, Voyage of the Damned. Uh, which is not really Christmas sounding. Look, this isn't a huge difference between either guy, but Tennant once again proves to have just a little bit more staying power and legacy over Smith. It's hard to see anyone else walking away from this round with a win. The legacy that David has created with his career and Doctor Who itself is virtually unmatched. From previously mentioned iconic performances and everything from Casanova to Fright Night, Tennant has secured his place in the massive pantheon of geek gods like Kevin Smith, 
Bruce Campbell and Charles Xavier. I keep forgetting that's actually played by a real guy, Sir Patrick Stewart. How many actors can say they've gotten to play as diverse and popular characters as The Doctor, Casanova, Peter Vincent, Scrooge McDuck, Hamlet, and Phileas Fogg? Tennant's run as The Doctor and his companions of Rose, Martha, and Donna have all left a lasting mark on the series and thus the audience. So much so that Tennant and Tate are returning next year once again for the 60th anniversary of Doctor Who. Let your speculation begin on the who, what, why, and how of all this being possible. Suffice to say, we're very excited. And with that, David Tennant once again scores a handy victory over Smith. It's four to nothing as we head into the wild card. Oh, no, no, no. It's the last category. Tennant's looking for the first ever skunk in the history of verses, but Matt Smith might have something inside that bow tie. Yeah. No. And now it's time for the wild card round, Christmas Spirit. Ah, the wild card is always that. It's freaking wild. And what better way to celebrate that notion than talking about one of the most exciting aspects of Doctor Who itself, the Christmas specials. For those new to Doctor Who, like I was last month, every year the series would get in the holiday spirit with a Christmas special that's become a must-watch event on the BBC. While many of the episodes were meant to be standalone, they'd also play into the bigger stories of the series, either as a fun epilogue to the season before, or as somewhat of a setup for the next season in the storylines. These episodes were also some of the most interesting and creatively inspired, so how else can we wrap up an epic battle than by pitting Tennant's Christmas specials against Matt Smith's and deciding whose episode featured the most holiday spirit? Tennant's very first one out of the gate, succeeding Christopher Eccleston's ninth Doctor, was the aptly titled The Christmas Invasion, which saw Tennant mostly knocked out until the episode's third act. One of the better Christmas episodes in his run, this one features rogue killer Christmas trees and evil masked Santas, but outside of that, Christmas doesn't really stand out as important to the story itself. This is actually going to be a recurring theme with David Tennant's specials. As far as The Runaway Bride is, and that's our first episode to feature Catherine Tate and Donna Noble, Christmas is even less important to the proceedings. Similarly, The Voyage of the Damned, which is basically Doctor Who's remake of the Poseidon Adventure, is fun, and much like its counterpart, it uses the holiday as a backdrop more than the drama itself. However, Tennant's fourth special, The Next Doctor, feels the most in line with the holiday spirit, though maybe that's just the Victorian era and the snow giving it that Dickensian veneer. David Morrissey as the mysterious Next Doctor is a welcome addition to the series, as is the reunion between he and Tennant following their work on Blackpool, which is a really fun musical mystery series that, again, you gotta watch it, trust me. But Tennant's final Christmas special, The End of Time Part 1, despite being a great story and featuring the return of John Sim as the master, just again doesn't feel all that Christmas-y. David Tennant, try as he might, can't quite finish all the cookies we left out for him, so now Matt Smith has an opening, can he finally score a point? That would be nice, yes. During Stephen Moffat's tenure as showrunner, Matt Smith got four Christmas specials as the 11th Doctor, all of which are really perfect for the holiday season. Moffat infuses every episode of his Christmas specials with the full spirit of the season, starting with Matt's very first outing, the aptly titled A Christmas Carol, which takes a rather unique approach to the classic Charles Dickens novel of the same name, maybe you've heard of it. This episode is a warm blank that has become a must-watch for any Whovian during Christmas. His next two episodes, The Doctor, The Widow, and The Wardrobe, and The Snowmen both continue to embrace the season of giving, especially The Snowmen, which would also reintroduce an old-school Who villain in The Great Intelligence, as well as Jenna Coleman's Clara, whose impossible girl would become the focus of the next several seasons of the show. Matt's final Christmas episode is The Time of the Doctor, in which the Doctor finds himself stranded in Christmas Town and it's Eleven's final stand against many of his most formidable enemies before regenerating into Peter Capaldi. It's safe to say that Matt Smith, yes, finally gets a victory in the wild card round. Who the man? Oh, so I'm never saying that again. Fine. His Christmas episodes feel like they couldn't exist without the holiday spirit and time, making them the quintessential December 25th viewing every single year. Unless your name is Phoebe Case from Gremlins, you're bound to enjoy the holidays. They get even merrier with a Matt Smith Doctor Who episode. Eleven gets off the schneid, Smith avoids being swept by Tennant, and it's 4-1, to one, which still means David Tennant is now officially our winner of today's match. His name, sir, is the Doctor. 
So Tenet is Time Lord victorious in this episode of Versus, and even though Matt Smith couldn't quite overtake Tenet, his career is not one to sneeze at, and we're excited for what's next for him. But who am I kidding? Even with all this, it's incredible to see the amount of work these two have put into their respective careers, and thanks to them and this assignment, you can now count me as one of the newer Doctor Who fans. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Now it's your turn, dear viewer. I know y'all love your Doctor Who. Who do you have in this battle for geek supremacy? Are you Team David or Team Matt? Which era of Doctor Who is your favorite? And what's your favorite project from each actor outside of the Doctor Who canon? Hit me up on social media at Mark Ellis Live with your take, and stay tuned right here to Rotten Tomatoes for all the latest in the world of Doctor Who, Matt Smith, David Tennant, and their many upcoming projects. Huge shout out to PJ Campbell for really manning the TARDIS and helping me through this episode. Thank you for tuning in to Versus. I'm Mark Ellis, and remember kids, if you stumble upon a phone booth, tread lightly. Could be Bill and or Ted's, could be Superman's fitting room, or it just might be that magical TARDIS. Of course, if you have a real doctor, I hope they own a cell phone. So long!